strange substance found by a southwest Arkansas man be part of a government test? Well, that's the question at the heart of a phenomenon called chemtrails, now getting widespread attention. Well, they say the government is dumping chemicals on us to control or manipulate the weather. And they say the unusual-looking jet trails in the sky are actually chemical-laden chemtrails. People say the government is up there in airplanes spraying all kinds of chemicals to change or manipulate the weather, leaving what you see there, and they call that a chemtrail. So when I look up there and I think of contrails, you're telling me our chemtrails. Yes, that a contrail would be dissipated by now. And it's interesting, Dale and Christina, this is of interest not just in this country, but uh, European countries and frankly all over the world. A lot of folks interested in it. Well, Dave, you mentioned that climatologists and others who study the atmosphere believe that they'd be able to surely spot any kind of signs of an ominous plot. Her journey started in San Diego, California, where thousands of scientists, engineers, policymakers, and journalists gathered for the American Association for the Advancement of Science Conference. One of the topics was the artificial manipulation of the Earth's climate, also called geoengineering. During the meeting, scientists spoke about the plausibility of implementing geoengineering campaigns throughout the world under the guise of preventing global warming. One widely accepted theory was to block the sun by spraying something into the atmosphere. When they were asked about existing aerosol programs, they stated clearly that no such programs have ever been implemented. But strangely, these proposals sounded exactly like what people around the world are claiming is already happening. When I found out that the American Association for the Advancement of Science was going to be held down here and the main body of uh, topics would be on geoengineering, I had to come. I, I had to be in on this. I had to hear what these top climate change scientists had to say. Uh, and as the other question about you know, chemtrails and whether geoengineering is being deployed right now without uh, our knowledge, uh, I don't have any personal insight into that um, other than to say that you know, I've worked in government at uh, you know, pretty high levels in the White House and in, uh, at state government. You know, I'm personally skeptical of that. Um, uh, but obviously, you never know what you don't know. Chemtrails. On the internet, they are cited as proof of the government creating clouds to combat global warming. They claim the American government, with the secret approval of the national government, is covertly using jet aircraft to spray population centres with aluminium, with barium, and with strontium, so as to reduce people's humidity and reduce the global population. I'm always a little bit suspicious because the government doesn't seem that um, capable to do something on such a large scale. You know? That is not rain, that is not snow. Believe it or not, military aircraft flying through the region dropping chaff. Small bits of aluminum, sometimes it's made of plastic or uh, even uh, telesized paper products, but it's used as an anti-radar issue and obviously they're up there practicing. Now they won't confirm that, but I was in the Marine Corps for many years and I'll tell you right now, that's what it is. What happens here, military jets don't come out of Key West Air Force Base and they move off into the atmosphere and they drop my large strips. Some could be a little wider, some are small glass fibers that are coated in aluminum. And what the Air Force does is they take their military jets and they dump these out of the aircraft, they fall into the atmosphere, and some take as much to a day to fall down. This is inevitably military or something going on. The government, the Air Force, you see this kind of a pattern like this, you can rest assured there's something going on. They're actually little bitty magnetic and little bitty strips of whether it's aluminum. Well, it's a nuisance to you and I to determine what's real and what's not, but it looks like it is a life-saving operation there from the military. The apparent motive behind this conspiracy theory is one world government. Oh, order, order, I cannot hear. Mr. Speaker, I want to assure the House that both my ministry and my colleague, the Minister of Health, who have received correspondence on this issue, that this conspiracy theory does not have an iota of truth and that the trails observed from aircraft simply come from jet engines. <laughs> number nine of order. And I think what an appalling example it is of the new foreign affairs spokesperson for the Labour Party that she's spreading order. conspiracy order. theories order. about the United order. States government. I think the House has heard sufficient. It is called geoengineering, fighting global warming by putting a chemical dust in the atmosphere and reflecting harmful radiation back into space. We take geoengineering to mean deliberate, large-scale intervention in the Earth system. There are a variety of schemes that have been discussed for geoengineering. A classic example 
is uh, injecting reflecting particles into Earth orbit. Nevertheless, there might be some good reason to think about alumina. It turns out, first of all, there's been a lot of work on the environmental consequences of alumina in the stratosphere. The big deal really is that alumina has four times the volumetric rate of forcing it for small particles as does sulfur. And that means you have four times less surface area for the same rate of forcing. And this is a much bigger deal. You have roughly 16 times less the coagulation rate. And that's the thing that really drives removal. So you could get away, we think, with much smaller mass ones. So that's why we see things like in the uh, use, use aircraft patent from 89, they talk about aluminum. And that's why we're seeing in the surface water samples aluminum. And here's David Keith saying uh, that aluminum has four times the reflective uh, volume surface area. So they'd like us to think that we're talking about sulfur, but here they slipped up and let it out that uh, aluminum is four times better to achieving their ends, and it sounds like it's kind of the one they don't want us to know the effects of. Mm. The little picture is from a nanofabrication study, which shows you can make very high quality, and do this in just a jet in a very simple way, make high quality alumina particles just by spraying alumina vapor out, which oxidizes. So it's certainly in principle possible to do that, and there's a big literature that's already looked at that. And you could do that by either building new versions of these aircraft or even re-engineering existing aircraft. So there's some ideas of that. So you go to an engineering firm and you want this done. They don't say this is hard or unusual. They say, okay, yes, we could do it. Aerosol geoengineering looks like it is so cheap that the cost is basically not going to be an issue. That means that implementation decisions will be risk-to-risk -risk decisions. The risk of doing it against the risk of not doing it. And it makes the problem of how we govern it fundamentally harder and different than normal. So I've told you this cheap to deliver materials to stratosphere, and I'm convinced that's true. I don't think that will change. But I think the more we do research, the less easy this will look, the more complicated the environmental effects will look. And that's a good thing, because right now it looks too easy. So I think that if we do more research, we're likely to find out that it's harder and more complicated than we thought, and that the side effects are harder to manage, and that's a healthy outcome that will make it easier to do the management. Of course, the opposite reaction is possible. It's an empirical question how people will actually react to knowledge about this. Another reaction is to say, if these crazy scientists are so concerned about putting CO2 in the atmosphere, they want to think about these things, then that might actually mean we should be more serious about the risks of CO2 in the atmosphere. And by the way, it's not really a moral hazard. It's more like free riding on our grandkids. And by the way, it's not really a moral hazard. It's more like free riding on our grandkids. Um, numerous air quality studies, uh, including from uh, CARB, California Air Quality Resource Board, have named submicron sized particulates as being particularly harmful for human respiration. Through all the discussions today, uh, I have not heard any mention of this fallout, and has, has this been studied, and also the effects of a highly reactive metal like aluminum on toxifying soils and waters? The question is, what would be the effects of these materials on human health if they came down into the stratosphere, in, uh, in, in particular, uh, small particles and aluminum. So, so the, the collaborators of mine working on the aerosol scheme are actually folks from Carnegie Mellon who focused on human health impacts. And while we haven't published it, that was the very first thing we did, was do the order of magnitude calculation in a level pencil and paper, but with an expert on human health impacts about whether there could be an issue. And, and for aluminum or other particles, there are a lot of toxicological things that need to get looked at seriously. But if you're just thinking about the sheer number of particles and the hu helmet, human health impacts of small particles, the answer is, well, we haven't published it. That was the first thing we looked at with some of the leading experts who do uh, epidemiological research on human health impacts, and it's not even close to being an issue. 10 megatons of aluminum dumped into the, the uh, atmosphere would have no human health impacts. So, so let me be more careful here. We're to separate out the toxicological. So the alumina, we've only begun to research and published nothing. The alumina, we've only begun to research and published nothing. Dane looked at him and he said, so you're telling me that spraying 10 to 20 megatons of aluminum, as you said, would have no human health effects? He took a deep breath and he swallowed and he said, let me be more careful here. We haven't done anything serious on alumina and so there could be something terrible that we'll find tomorrow we haven't looked at. And that for me, that was the whole main point of, of what is, is going to be coming out to the public. It's, it's the damaging effects of aluminum that are being found around the world in massive amounts. Here's David Keith confronted on this very issue, and he, he looked, you know, at that point like, like they just let the cat out of the bag. Mm -hmm. 
we haven't done anything serious on Illumina, and so there could be something terrible that we'll find tomorrow we haven't looked at. They're proceeding because they have an agenda that's separate from trying to thwart this crisis of global warming. You know, there's, there's obviously several other objectives, whether it's depopulation, control, uh, weapons aspects, communications aspects, all kinds of things, you know, wild cards that we know nothing about. We don't really know, and I'm not going to attempt to speculate on exactly what the agendas are, but we can see clearly they're not, uh, they're not, the agendas are not benefiting mankind. You know, it's benefiting the agenda of the elite. And so I think the question is how do you draw the line between some activity uh, that is allowed and doesn't need global governance and activities that do require global governance. Dr. John Holdren has agreed to serve as assistant to the president for science and technology and director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. I look forward to his wise counsel in the years ahead. My personal opinion is that we have to keep geoengineering on the table. We have to look at it very carefully because we might get desperate enough to want to use it. So what would we do if in year 2040 or 2060 there's a severe climate crisis, say widespread famines or Greenland sliding suddenly into the ocean, that the only plausible way in which we could start the earth cooling this century is to directly intervene in the climate system, say by putting particles in the stratosphere. We do stuff in the stratosphere all the time, of course, and so it's not as though the stratosphere is absolutely pristine. But you don't want to have people going off and doing things that involve large radiative forcings or go on for extended periods or for that matter provide lots of reactive surfaces that could uh, result in significant ozone destruction. You know, maybe I'm putting a particle into the atmosphere because I'm trying to make money or maybe I'm putting a particle into the atmosphere because I'm engaging in scientific research and trying to understand cloud physics or maybe I'm putting this particle into the atmosphere because I'm trying to make it rain uh, locally uh, to, to seed a cloud and get more snow on our ski slopes and this obviously raises all kinds of questions it's hugely risky uh, it will likely negatively impact some people, but we might find ourselves in a situation where those risks seem worth taking. One of the things that really shocked me was uh, in, one, in one of the breakouts they had the benefits of these programs and then the risks. Now the benefits, the one thing that was stated was the uh, just cooling the planet. You know, some of the risks were ozone depletion, um, droughts in Africa and Asia, I got to tell you, uh, I came away from this experience after listening to these scientists for four days, four days of symposiums, really concerned because it's clear now that they are justifying, rationalizing, and looking to uh, legitimize some really, really horrible impacts, further impacts on our environment and they're basically formulating the sales strategy and the implementation and oversight strategy and the funding strategy. After San Diego, I was shocked by the programs that had been proposed. I decided to write about it. That night when I finished, I sent the article to an online publication with my email address attached. When I woke up the next morning, my inbox was flooded with responses from around the world. Why? Because I had just broken the story on aluminum in geoengineering models, which I had no clue at the time that very few people knew about. Now this metal, aluminum, is being found in massive quantities way above normal levels all over in rain, in soil, and in snow. After that, the calls started pouring in from people who were desperate for someone to investigate. That was the fuel that started the film. Before we started filming, we had the opportunity to sit down with one of our favorite authors and documentarians, G. Edward Griffin, to find out what he knew about the subject. I'd like to talk uh, for a minute about an issue that's getting more and more attention. That's the issue which scientifically is called stratospheric aerosol geoengineering, also called the chemtrail issue. I'm very aware of the chemtrail versus contrail controversy. As far as I'm concerned, it's an open and shut case. I have been watching the development of uh, jet travel from its very beginning. I used to live near the Los Angeles airport. Remember when 
The first jets came in and landed. Man, they made a big noise. We never heard a noise like that before. And we used to go down and sit at the end of the runway and watch these jets come in and, and take off uh, because it was a novel experience. I've been watching jets all my life, and I know about jet contrails. I've watched them. They, they're vaporized uh, moisture, ice crystals, and they get out there in the atmosphere, and then they uh, effervesce and evaporate and then disappear, and you can see them. The plane moves along, and the little white trail follows right behind it, and usually about 10 or 20 lengths of the plane or thereabouts, and then it's gone. And you can still see them that way, by the way, once in a while. So there goes a contrail. These other things we're talking about are not at all the same phenomena at all. These planes go by, and they billow out this white smoke, and it covers the sky from horizon to horizon. It doesn't dissipate at all. And they crisscross each other. And you see this thing cover the sky and turn it milky, and then people start having trouble breathing, and then you hear stories about the, the aluminum and barium deposits that they're picking up and the residue. And you put it all together, and I don't see how anybody who's got their eyes open and their mind open can come to any other conclusion but that somebody is spending a lot of money and effort to spray the planet. The question is, why? I have my own theories, but I hope that there will be some good investigative reporters go out there and get us the answer. I know that whenever it's finally discovered, and it will be, the people who are doing it will undoubtedly say, oh, well, we did it for you folks. It's for the greater good of the greater number. It's for the society. It's probably to prevent global warming, or maybe it's to inoculate people against some kind of a dreaded biological attack. We can't go around shooting everybody in the arm, but we can spray them and save their lives. You see how good we are? We're doing it for the benefit of society. I know they're going to, whatever it is, they're going to say it was for your good, but mine. Think of this. We had the ability to steer hurricanes, and the hurricane was going to slam into New Orleans. And let's say you could steer it so it would hit Mississippi instead. Where for a hundred, that means I would be willing to uh, more or less kill 18 Mississippians to say 1,800 New Orleanians. Uh, you know that uh, you know. Are, and if you do that knowingly, are you murdering those hundred people? And there's all kinds of equity issues there. Now, also, we might be wrong about our steering, and and if we didn't do the research right, maybe our steering would intensify Katrina and even kill more people in, in New Orleans. And so this question of how do you develop the confidence to know that your in intervention will reduce overall damage, and then how do you deal with the understanding that you might be damaging some people who wouldn't have been damaged before while saving people overall? The spraying appears to be mostly in NATO countries. I've seen it here in the United States, I've seen it in England, I've seen it in Scotland, um, I've seen it in Canada, and I've had reports uh, from people who live in France. There's a grouping, there's a political grouping here of some sort. It's international in scope. It's not just an American phenomenon, it's international. And um, anybody that wants to investigate that, I think has to take that fact into consideration. They're gonna find a political grouping and a political motive here. But in my humble opinion, it's not in your good or mine at all. I don't know what it is, but we'll soon find out. I'm sure that uh, if you follow the old advice, which is follow the money, you'll come to the answer sooner or later. Soon we realized that we all shared the same need to get this information out there, to share with the public, to let people know what is being done. Ed felt so passionately about the issue, he offered to help us. Well, the main thing now, since it uh, looks like the budget is going to be met, uh, is to get it done well. We don't come uh, off the tree knowing any answers at all. Yeah, we're not scientists. We're, not, we're just asking questions, exactly. And we, you know, we've got to be very skeptical about the answers. That's uh, it's totally accurate, totally honest. Why can't people see this? They're not hearing it. They don't know that the facts are not being presented. We're very lucky, you know that. Look at this opportunity that's been dumped on us. <laughs> opportunity. It's well, this is it, it is. It's, 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 it
obviously going to be a battle. I know that. A challenge in a battle, but I mean, why are we here if it's not for that? I go to get home tomorrow, so it's going to be you for the moment. I'll call him again. So. Sounds good. I saw the sky crisscross mm -hmm. with camp trails, and I don't, I can't remember if it was in L.A. or if I, I was on the road, but I had looked up one day, and I thought, look at that. That's not the flight path, man. That was a yeah. grid, a grid, a regular grid. Yeah over the city milky, and I couldn't milky, believe my eyes. Milky white clouds. And you know, it all seems very obvious and now the evidence of what we have on the ground with the aluminum, the barium, strontium, and with what we see in the patents and what the geoengineers say are gonna happen. I mean, for the everyday Joe, this is a slam dunk. This is a very delicate moment for the powers that be because they're taking a covered up operation like the tropospheric aerosol program or chemtrails. Project Akira's, whatever, it's had many names over the years. And they're making it over into a geoengineering scientific uh, shield to deflect sunlight because global warming's out of hand. So at this very moment, the belly of the beast is right above us with no armor. Whether people believe in chemtrails or not, the geoengineering should be scary enough. And when people learn about geoengineering, chemtrails will then become apparent because they're the same. Huh. So you're talking about global conspiracy here. Geoengineers propose doing this on, on a global level. Off to Redding, California. Yes, this is the second step after the 88 AF meeting. We'll see what we find. Right here in Northern California at Dane Wigginton's house, he owns over 2,000 acres overlooking Lake Shasta. He told me about some of the challenges that they're having up here. Let's go and talk to Dane. We'll see, you know, what's going on on his property. We'll see what he's going through and also what, what action he's taking based on the test results that he has. As you know, I have a background in the energy fields. I worked in the first solar plants in the continental U.S. in the early 80s. My home was on the cover of the world's largest renewable energy magazine. So this is my background. My goal has been to alert the public there is a mountain of toxic material falling on us, period. Before, about five years ago, our skies were typically blue, and now you see it's covered with lines and haze. And virtually nothing you see on the horizon, nothing you see in the sky above us is a natural cloud. I mean, it is, it is virtually all the remnants of these aircraft lines that you see uh, fanning out, spreading into clouds, uh, artificial clouds, but the sky is a very dirty look to it. Uh, there's not the white cloud blue sky that we had only a few years ago, but it looks like there's some sort of massive industrial activity or forest fires burning over there, and we see that typically every night. You see even, even down to ground level, the clarity drops off significantly and um, we don't see that all, except for the days when we have these long lingering trails that uh, spread and cover the whole sky. And on certain days you can see these trails actually dropping vertically like a veil. Uh, we assume the particulates are descending and, and we have the test to prove that uh, we are being inundated with uh, levels of aluminum and particulates that are literally tens of thousands of times what would already be considered high. So we're not talking about uh, exposure to uh, a, a slight percentage higher of, of these toxic materials. We're, we're talking about quantities, for example, off the side of Mount Shasta. If you can pan back, that's a, that's a landmark in Northern California, considered to be a pristine water source. Uh, Aluminum or snow sample off the side of Mount Shasta tested 61,000 parts per billion. This is just ordinary snow water, and people are drinking this stuff when they're hiking on the mountain. And remember, government action is required at a thousand. This is 61 times over the government limit, and our hikers are drinking this poisonous water on Mount Shasta Mountain oh itself. God. Barium, 83. Strontium, 383. So this summer, the people climbing are drinking poison. Uh, basically. I, I certainly wouldn't want to drink 61,000 micrograms per liter of aluminum. And again, we, we've already seen in five years soil pHs in this area that have escalated 
10 to 12 times, and we can prove that conclusively. Well, this is not speculation. We can prove conclusively that these metals have been in the rain. We have duplicate samples. Bachelor of Science in Forestry, International School of Forestry at Missoula, Masters in Zoology, specialized in aquatics, 35 years with the U.S. Forest Service as a wildlife biologist, and before that, uh, several years with the USDA Soil Conservation Service as a soil conservationist. Also have run the botany programs, uh, range and grazing programs, and I continue that today. Right now I do a lot of master gardener consultation work. When I started this garden back in about 2005 or so, the pH here was 5.5, 5.6. This is the old soil survey of the county. Mm -hmm. You can look at the page right here. This is my soil right here. Mm -hmm. It's a Dietz 125, 126 here at my house. And here, the soil reaction pH should be between 4.5 and 6.0. And over there in the pure mud, it's even a little darker. It's 6.8 right there. And, and what can this do to plant life? in ecosystems? Well, you haul one of these things out and you start looking at the little little things that are crawling around the soil, a lot of times they aren't there anymore. The uh, little soil arthropods that you can barely see on a microscope, you can actually see movement with this. Little tiny, tiny, tiny macroscopic, look like little moving pieces of dust. Those start to go away. They're not gone entirely, but they start to go away. This is black oak acorns. You know, this is, this is pieces of cedar wood. You know, come on, folks. This should be very acid, and I'm getting 10 times higher than expected. There's something really wrong here. Well, you can see all those uh, reports, you, lots you of them. You have over 20 reports here. Uh, well, at least 20. I'd say it'd be closer to 30. All revealing dangerous amounts of aluminum and barium. You know, the science is there that something funny is happening, and the naysayers say, well, so what? Isn't neutral good? Well, no, neutral's not good. Neutral is not good. If your soil is supposed to be 5.6, it should stay 5.6 if you want the forest to be healthy. And if you want to grow a good garden, you have to keep your pH around 6.0, 6.5. I think that we just need to wake up and just look at what's happening because we can't just ignore it because it's going to get worse and worse if we just keep ignoring it and pushing it away like, oh, that's nothing. There was mason jars and they were brand new, sterilized, and that's what we catch the rain in. Mm -hmm. And then there was a HEPA filter that we tested the air with. Okay, so you caught rain and then you, you basically filtered air. What did you find? Aluminum. Here's another test that's revealing 375,000 yeah. parts per million aluminum, barium at 3,090, and strontium at 345. Yeah, that's from a lined pond. With EPDM fish safe pond liner, there is no chemicals, manufacturing materials at all in that pond liner that's uh, available to the aquatic life. It's designed for that purpose. The well that feeds this pond has been tested and retested. ND, no detectable aluminum, zero. The only other place this pond can receive water is rainfall. We are located on a filtered forested hilltop, miles and miles and miles away from any industry, highway, and so forth. After several heavy spray days, there was a film that we, we received formed on the surface of the water, and we tested that crust, and it was uh, aluminum and barium that after a year and a half's accumulation had 375,000 parts per billion of aluminum in it, it's literally toxic. We can say conclusively that what we see in the sky matches expressly what's outlined in numerous patents, and the materials on the ground match those patents. This material was not there five years ago. It is a recent phenomena in the quantities it's in. It, it has escalated in some cases 50,000% in five years in the case of aluminum. From our original baseline reading of seven parts per billion, which was already high, it has escalated up to 50,000% in five years. And we've seen profound changes in that time. Dr. Leonard Time, um, PhD in chemistry, I cross-checked with him. 
and he says the oxides of aluminum, barium, and strontium will drive your pH into the coastal from an acid soil like this up into the neutral. There's no question about it. And, and that's exactly? That's exactly what you see happen. Wow. I have a doctorate in inorganic chemistry from Oregon State University mm -hmm. in which I was working with different metals and oxidation states mm -hmm. and then did a postdoctorate work at Brandeis where I was working stabilizing off oxidation states of different metals. The goal is to sort of figure out how everything fits in the dynamic equilibrium of life. I was working with Francis up in uh, Mount Shasta and he showed me some rainwater analyses that had to do with levels of aluminum, strontium and barium in the atmosphere. So I feel the major toxin in these chemtrails is the aluminum. And from the levels we were looking in at Mount Shasta, this is totally, totally unacceptable. When you get to metals and biological systems, you're no longer talking about the bulk aluminum that people think about when they're using, drinking from soda pop cans and that. So once it gets to the aluminum oxide stage, it just forms a plaque within your arteries mm -hmm. and shuts down life. When you take elements that normally aren't out in the environment and you start putting them in the environment, it raises some serious red flags. Mm -hmm. Aluminum is a very specific nasty in biological systems. It takes that site and it never lets go and it shuts down the site and that's it. And so as you accumulate aluminum over time, mm -hmm it causes major neurological damage because it ends up as aluminum oxide that's essentially stuck in place and can't be flushed out by normal systems. At the core of everyone's condition, there's always some level of toxins. And aluminum is known to have, have cancer-causing effects. The half-life is decades. I think that we should be working on taking more of these toxins out of our environment instead of adding more toxins in. It's very concerning that if we add more toxins to our environment that will be increasing the rates and risks of cancers. Even one patient is not worth it. So sad that they would consider putting aluminum in our environment to affect something when they could be causing so much more damage. Wherever the material is coming from, it is there. The amount of metal falling on us cannot be disputed. Absolutely, this is not speculation. The, the amount of metal in the last uh, four years, as I said, have uh, increased to a degree of thousands of times. And um, California Air Quality Resources Board has, has studied the aerosols from China. These metals are not amongst them. Mike, the reason I've chosen to, to focus so primarily on this issue is I feel all other issues are secondary what could be a greater priority than not being able to walk out your door and take in a breath of air without sucking up heavy metals? If our land base is being poisoned, if our waters are being toxified, what will we have left to work with? Whatever we choose to focus our time and energy on, whatever our political beliefs, that this is a common ground for all of us. We, we must have air that we can breathe that's not full of toxic chemicals and metals. We must have water that's not completely laden with whatever is being emitted from these aircraft. And if people stopped to consider that the atmosphere is as thin as a layer of paint on a basketball, it is an extremely thin layer that allows life to exist on this planet. To simply treat it as a physics lab and experiment with it until it is broken beyond repair is folly of, of unbelievable proportion. And if people understood that this sort of experimentation not only is going on, but has been going on for a very, very long time. Uh, going back 50 years, there's been uh, countless climate manipulation, weather modification programs that the, the vast majority of the public is completely unaware of. And if they think that, that this is not true, that certainly they that somehow they would have known if it was occurring, I, I would ask them to, to look at things like Agent Orange and the things that, that governments do because they can because there's no one to stop them. Because they have uh, these, these huge military machines that, that um, 
want to control everything. And in fact, the government's own document, perhaps you may have seen, it's available to any online, is called Owning the Weather, an express goal of our government, and not just our government. He told the Associated Press uh, that the American government has created weather tampering techniques so that the new world order will be able to starve millions of Americans and to control the rest. There is weather control techniques. Number one, the entire patents on the equipment. Number two, Senator Claiborne Pell's complete statement and story of his own that not only does it exist, but that we even utilize it as far back as the Vietnam War. Well, we're going to do what we can. Let's okay. see what we can do. you got the scientists behind you. The scientists are with you, so uh, at least this scientist is with you. I may not have a million dollar budget, but I've got enough to show that something's dreadfully wrong. You got it. All right. So Arizona will be... Mon this Monday, the 21st, Senator Johnson up in Sholo. So we're going to be in the car a long time. Well, it is such a pleasure. <laughs> this is such meet a you. place back here, I'm yeah, telling you, Michael. Great. But you know this what? We love it. It's so private and it's so quiet and peaceful. And oh. Please come in. My name is Karen Johnson. I served in the Arizona State Legislature for 12 years. I was in the House for eight of those years and in the Senate for four of those years. When you see a plane fly overhead, there's a trail that leaves the end of that plane and it goes from one horizon all the way to the other as the plane flies across. And it begins to filter out and cover more and more of the sky in kind of ripples. It widens out and fills the whole sky I mean, it, how could anybody think that that was the case? And then to live and to be underneath that and know that whatever is in that is falling down upon you and upon your animals and upon the earth. And I mean, it's frightening to me. And if people don't start really waking up and facing the fact that we've got people that are doing terrible things to us and we had better wake up and fight back now. I mean, I'm the mom of 11 kids. I've got 35 grandkids. I mean, I've got a stake in this. I care about what is going to be left for my children. I care about it, and I'm extremely worried about what is going to be left to them. Aluminum is toxic, and we know that it's accumulative. And we know that we're getting more. So we're absorbing it in the air. We're drinking it in our water. So we are accumulating more. So the thought of more aluminum being dispersed in our environment in the way that you mentioned is very frightening to us and very disturbing to us. Those of us who have done any research on this are really quite concerned that we are ill-informed about this issue and mostly that it's being done. Uh, aluminum is toxic, we know that it is. Uh, we can debate as to the amount of toxicity that is gonna be disturbing the body, but as far as uh, really accepting the fact that it's accumulative, it's synergistic, then we have to conclude that it's not a good idea to put it in our atmosphere, especially when we know we're getting increased amounts, and especially since we know that the scientific communities around the world are pointing a finger at the heavy metal toxicities at the toxicities that we're absorbing in, in the day-to-day -day food that we eat and the air that we breathe. The concern is, is off the charts about why is this happening? Why is this being allowed to be sprayed continually all over the United States, all over the world? Uh, who is paying for this? I mean, the incidence of Alzheimer's has just skyrocketed, which evidently has to do with an accumulation of aluminum in the brain cells. I mean, I think almost every family has been touched by a member, as they get older, having Alzheimer's. And, and it's a horrible, it's a horrible disease. And to say that, well, this just came because people drank soda pop out of aluminum cans, you know, when my father passed away with Alzheimer's and he didn't ever drink soda pop, you know, that, that explanation doesn't ring true with me. And so I'm wondering how much did this chemtrail spraying back in the Illinois area affect him? Aluminum and fine metal is an accelerant. 
friend who's a firefighter up uh, in Pine, Arizona for 20 or 30 years mm -hmm. says that the wildfires now that they're fighting uh, are way beyond anything they've mm -hmm. seen before uh, in intensity. And when you look at the air samples and you see the fine particles of aluminum, which is very flammable, and magnesium settling on the trees, uh, this is causing unprecedented uh, savage wildfire. But if you look at this, you can see the these are parts uh, per million. They sent this to me, and I just found this to be extremely interesting because we should have like two parts per million of aluminum in our air. And this is saying that there's 39,000 parts of aluminum. That's astronomical. Barium is high. I mean, these are way off the charts of what people should be breathing or what's coming down on them. And, you know, if people wonder why their health is deteriorating, why they're having to go to emergency rooms, why they can't breathe, you know, why they're getting Alzheimer's. This has been planned. We have elites, I don't know what you want to call them, one world or Illuminati, I don't know, whatever you want to call them. But with these people that don't care about the average person, they only care about themselves, their greed, their power, and if they eliminate, you know, two thirds, three fourths of us from the planet, so much for the better for them because then they don't have so many people to have to hurt around and worry about so this is uh, this is a lot what this is about and this is very very alarming and scary i mean where is this stuff coming from and why why is this kind of stuff being put out there uh you know i've heard different explanations about oh we need to cool the planet all this and that but if people are up there trying to cool the planet, why do they need all this kind of stuff in, in it? Uh, the explanations just never have really rang very true. And as I'm setting up the equipment, she looked at me and she said, all these trees here are dying. And I said, what? She says, all these trees in here are dying. So I thought, well, I'm going to test for aluminum because that's one of the key things in the programs that we're talking about and titanium, and I took some of this bark sample and tested it, and it came back positive with aluminum and titanium. Mm -hmm. Then I started traveling around California, noticing the same thing. In Lake Tahoe, uh, there, there was a lot of the same type of bark all through Sacramento area and Davis. Just about everywhere I went, I was noticing this silver white bark. Mm -hmm. What I think is happening is these chemicals are getting down and destroying the roots and then as they come up, they're going out into the bark. Those two right there are the ones that are, are just, it just hurts so bad to see these two because look how old and big they are. We probably lost 40 trees right here on our 10 acres. Every week, every other weekend, we'd see another tree that was beginning to die. And I mean, it's just so sad, we'd just cry. And to think that that might have something to do with it, along with their other explanations, would really, really frost me. Every time you lose a tree, you know, it's, it's not good. It's just sad. And there's another one over here in this little group of trees here. Don't you feel better when you stand up and fight than if you crawl down in a little hole and go to sleep? You know, I mean, my gosh, people, there are, your families are out there, children are out there, your grandchildren. I mean, you've got to do something to help. My greatest hope is to get people to question and hey if they don't wake up while we're there I'm hoping to plant some seeds. We're going to the most beautiful place on the planet, Hawaii, to see what's going on, collect some data. Thank you for having fun with us. Hope you enjoyed the trip. Have a great vacation and welcome home if you're lucky enough to live here. Thank you. 
the whole valley is off the cape, so it's either solar, wind, or um, generators. Look at this, man. Yeah, the mind can't even conceive of a dream. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. Even even coming here, and, and one would never think, you know, in, in paradise, that, that it's getting destroyed. And they're doing it island style. They do it off the island, right? They do it off the island so they don't, you know, you don't see the chemtrail airplane. The theory is that they're spraying the ocean, yeah. offshore and, and it's coming in on the... And it's coming in. Now, these are coming from the west. They're also spraying on both sides today. A lot of this stuff is actually chemtrails coming this direction. There's material that's blocking. We should be able to see to the horizon, you know, where the earth curves, because we're high enough and we have the ocean, right? So we should be able to see, we should be able to see the big island. It's only 30 miles away. And you can see it's not a blue sky behind it. That's the key. It's all, it's all you know, has that kind of weird looking blue. Like silver blue, I call it. And this is a nice day. You know, there's no more blue sky. The night, we're gonna look at the stars at night. It's like, there's, you'll see, you can count them. There's so few stars at night now. There should be hundreds of thousands of stars, and I can count the stars. There's like one here, and one here, and one planet here. It's like, you might see, some nights you'll see a hundred, some nights you'll see 10. This is what concerns me, this kind of stuff right here. It's just soft. Okay. This just comes right off, this bark. That's not natural. For I've seen hundreds of thousands of coconuts and I've never seen it falling apart like that. Look, look at this, you guys. I've never seen anything like this. I used to trim trees all the time in the Big Island. I've never seen anything like that. That's why I'm concerned. Not an easy task that you have here on the island. I could see the skepticism because it is so far beyond anybody's reality. It's amazing. It's just amazing to not to try to look through somebody else's eyes. Like my eyes, I, I can see this so it's like night and day. And other people it's just it's just the the, the the illusion is just so deep. What do you think would happen if everybody awakened to uh, to what was going on and what the plans were of geoengineers? I think <laughs> I think they'd have a revolution in Hawaii if people really understood what was going on. What's your concern for, I know that, that you love the land here, what do you, what's your concern about the chemtrails? Well, that, that we won't be able to live here and grow our own food and that our health is going to be compromised. Do you uh, think it already has been? Yes. And the, the thing is that they're doing it every day here, every day. So it's hammering, 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 micro doses every day. And then, of course, it's getting in the environment. And of course, it's weakening the plants. And it takes a couple years for this to actually weaken the plant. So we need, we're asking for GMO taro. We're asking for GMO papaya because we can't grow our natural seeds. We can't be sustainable. We can't truly, you know, be here as God created us to be. And so my friend convinced me to do a hair analysis on my daughter. So we went ahead and cut close to her scalp and got some really recent, recently grown hair and sent it in. I was just sure that my daughter's hair was going to be so clean with the lifestyle that we live. And lo and behold, it came back and her levels were really high in aluminum. This is the chart here. Um, this is the reference range and this is where my daughter is, 23.1. Aluminum, the skies are covered with a white mist, and I look up at night anymore and I don't see the deep, dense stars that I used to, and I can't help but think this obviously has something to do with my daughter's health. I don't know where else these heavy metals are coming from. Yeah, I mean, look, look how old she is. Yeah. She's been isolated here. Here, and she's... Uh, uh, here, anybody looking at the situation would be like, this is paradise. This child should be like super human. organic foam, and here you are getting all this heavy metal stuff. And she, has, you, she has highest level of aluminum on the chart. Never had a vaccine either. Folks, these people are playing God. They are playing God. They're manipulating the weather, and they're spraying stuff into the sky. They are trying to geoengineer 
everything, including your plants and trees and your ocean. Well, tonight, we're just hoping that instead of not looking at it, you start looking into it because I really believe from the bottom of my heart that we are in a real crisis. I really do. They are proposing dumping 10 to 20 million tons of aluminum into the upper atmosphere. What does aluminum do? It changes the pH of soils, which is toxic to plant life. Also, it's very toxic to human health. Are they doing it? Well, let me tell you about my experience and what we found. We have much evidence that not only suggests, but I believe proved that they are happening. And as I promised, we're joined right now by a very special guest, Michael J. Murphy, currently on location uh, in Hawaii. He's working on a documentary film called What in the World Are They Spraying? Michael, welcome to the program. Great to speak with you today. I had a friend who recently, he, he's, he's, uh, he's always looking at, at, at things from a different perspective. He's a bit, he's a bit of um, uh, a conspiracy theorist, you know, and he says that whenever the president comes to L.A., there's no spraying that week. Could you have a better place for an interview? I mean, look. <laughs> this is being done mm -hmm. over, our, over our farms and over our things, so basically they want to eliminate our ability to eat organic food, clean food, have clean water. So it, in some ways, it, it sounds to me like, and you know, again, it's just a projection, but it sounds to me like this is control. How do we control the masses? Yeah. How can aluminum be good for you in any? And what was the second in, chemical in, in, in. you mentioned? It's, uh, it's barium. Barium and aluminum. Obviously, those are toxic to, to, to everything. To human health. To Absolutely. human health, to, to farms, to animals, to everything. 61,000 parts per billion. And th there should be a government alert at 1,000? At, at 1,000, people are drinking this. People that climb the mountain, they're drinking that snow. It's poison. Oh, my God. That's so disgusting. So that's, that's 60,000 times above regulation. It, exactly. 60,000 times above regulation. And I've, I've talked to friends, and they're like, well, that's just ice. That's mm -hmm. just condensation. I, and I'm like, you can talk to a second grader. Ice doesn't float in the sky and spread out that way, you know? You're not an expert, but you're a concerned citizen who said, wait a second, it's actually I want to, yeah, you're doing the research, and that's what we need to do as Americans and say, you know what, I want to know what's going on. I want to know what the FDA is doing to my food. I want to know what the government's doing with my air and my water and, and, and the soil. And, you know, it's just great what you're doing. And, and, and I, I just, my kudos to you for, for bringing light to this subject. Put all of the theories aside, just what geoengineers are proposing and what's being found is scary enough. So we can just address that. And I encourage, you know, I encourage more people to just step up and ask questions and, and do what he's doing. So thank you, Michael, very, very much. Uh, aerosol spraying aluminum uh, affects everywhere. And we have a beautiful tropical climate, which I believe might be in jeopardy. So we wanted to not only come and, and bring the message of what people were finding around the world, but encourage people to test for the aluminum strontium barium. Essentially, I think it was an effective trip. I saw a lot of people here in Hawaii, in Maui, awake and not only curious, but willing to look into this deeper. And that's my only hope. And this is one of the boldest moves, I think, from Ed Griffin yet. Uh, this is the taboo topic that nobody's supposed to talk about, and that is aerosol spraying. Now, we've got the tons of documented proof of errant aerosol spraying. It, it just blows my mind that, that the whole essence of humanity has always been to look up into the sky and ask why. Though there are no limitations, there is endless space, an endless universe. Now, in the 21st century, we're not allowed to do that. Anyone who looks up and sees the giant grids and the X's in the sky that, that weren't part of our existence until just a, a decade or two ago is somehow called a kook. And the people that are the best and biggest proponents for the revolution and for liberty, they don't want you to talk about it because you could discredit them.
it, it seems to be an industry that's being built up to uh, to milk the taxpayers by undergoing some kind of a giant a spraying global spraying program to make all kinds of money on the project and they don't seem to care really what effect it has they're not trying to experiment to see if humans can survive it or anything like that they just want to get this stuff up and then we discover as we're going further down the line that there are companies generating a uh, genetically modified organisms, or seeds, uh, modified seed crops that are they're being engineered to resist the aluminum in the soil. And a lot of crops won't grow in that, and so now after they've messed up the soil, all the farmers are going to have to go back and uh, buy seeds that have been yeah. genetically engineered to resist the aluminum that have been put into the soil, and all of a sudden. Uh, mankind is completely dependent upon these uh, companies like Monsanto and other giant uh, agricultural firms. You can't even grow natural seeds anymore. And we're looking at that. It, it's, a, it's a shocking thing. I hope, I hope we don't find that that's true. But all the arrows right now are pointing in that direction. We get into cost-benefit analysis here because there's also HARP could be involved in this. Geoengineering, as you guys mentioned, which is documented heavily in Dennis Kucinich's uh, bill that is the Space Preservation Act, uh, which, by the way, I don't think got through Congress. And then Kay Bailout, as we call her here, Kay Bailey Hutchinson, uh, also put together some legislation in order to qualify geoengineering, which, again, is supposed to save us all from global warming. But it is cost-benefit analysis because they can benefit on so many different levels. Ed, that's how they do everything, isn't it? That's right. And, you know, there's an old adage, if you just follow the dollar, follow the buck, you usually you get to the source of the problem. And it looks to me like there's a tremendous, uh, tremendously profitable industry uh, being built up right now uh, around this concept of geoengineering or weather modification or reducing global warming and all of these other things that can be sold fairly easily to an unsuspecting public. They all say, oh, well, that's good. We, we don't want global warming, you know. And so they put up with this and they don't question, they don't criticize. But behind the scenes, you see a whole industry being built up, which is, uh, as I say, tremendously profitable. And the the money for all of that is coming uh, from the taxpayers. And uh, it, it's a scam is basically what it is. We're just focusing on the one area that is real easy to prove. There's no speculation in the, in the area that we're going into. They definitely are uh, doing this geoengineering. They definitely are talking about it. They've, they're working up formulas for it. They're putting together strategies for it. They've got funding for it. Everything is in place. We don't even have to go into those other areas to make the case. Um, okay, let them, let them believe that, but at least they must understand that there's no question that they're talking about it and planning to do it. And so shouldn't they be equally alarmed about what they're going to do? If it can be shown that barium and aluminum and some of these other toxic metals are very destructive to the planet and destructive to human health, isn't that enough? You know, how many, how many issues do we need to crank into this? And so, <laughs> you know, if you're going to kill the planet and kill the population, do we need any other reason to be alarmed? What in the world are they spraying? Thank God people are asking this question. That's all we want. We just want to be able to ask these questions. Uh, our good friend G. Edward Griffin, all these years, Mike Murphy and Paul Wittenberg are doing this great effort with your help. This is a community effort to get people real information. What in the world are they spraying? Um, any final quick comments before we're out of time? And my only final thought is that we asked the question, what in the world are they spraying? And we now know what it is. And folks, you're not going to like it. Hey. Hey. I'm Peter Vreke. I'm from Belgium. I'm uh, 54 years old. I can't believe it myself. I'm uh, a very happy and grateful person. We are doing the job. The police or the justice department or the environmental department should, should, should have been doing and, and, and it's really essential that it's going to be a grassroots uh, uh, revolution i think so because, uh, on side because we are not fighting against but for yes yes we're fighting for. for i was in the council for about 25 years and also a period as the mayor so from that moment on 10 years ago everything started to change 
I start to get a picture of what is really going on. And it became crystal clear to me that we, humankind, have been uh, manipulated and dominated and uh, exploited for centuries. So, and this uh, country of phenomena made me angry because I was so helpless. You can uh, decide what food you're going to eat, what you're going to smoke, uh, what uh, water you're going to drink, what kind of life you're going to lead, but not uh, with this phenomenon. Then you are just a victim. It's only a game. And they have to be good guys, and they have to be bad guys. And luckily, we are in the position to uh, be able to play the role of the good guy who has the chance and the opportunity to uh, overcome. Three days that we shared with them, my heart just, just dropped because it was such a beautiful way to live and such a peaceful way to live. I left thinking, what, what's this gonna be like in 10 years? Are, are, is, is everything gonna be killed off on the property? And, and if it is, what's, how are they gonna get their food source? Are they gonna have to take, take a class you know, and get certified by company XYZ, and what are the requirements for that? And that really is the end of freedom. I'm concerned about that. I definitely, uh, I really am. Yeah. I learned to say everything is now as it has to be now, and everything is going to be okay. It's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. Yes. I have this uh, deep feeling that in the end we will prevail because we have the right on our side. The cosmos is helping us. And I have, I have this uh, strong feeling that we are being supported by entities and by forces we can't even imagine. Here for the first time, we have this scientific uh, proof that we are being spread. We are being spread and it's incredible and it's hard to believe, but we are being spread. I think at this moment to stop is not an option. Once you know it and once you have a tool like this and an opportunity like this, that the issue of chemtrails or persistent jet contrails or whatever name you use for it, that this um, uh, phenomenon is recognized as being real, publicly debated on. In the context of geoengineering, I think it's high noon to bring this to the public. This is what the sky is supposed to look like. These are old paintings. We forgot this, I'm afraid. In the years that I have been a medical research journalist, I have looked at many, many things, and I found the same three issues in whatever I'm looking at. And that is that we are being dumbed down, we are being made sicker, and we are being made infertile. Citizens gathered from around the world in Belgium for the first International Chemtrail Symposium. The event attracted leading professionals, politicians, and activists who discussed the health, environmental, and social implications of these programs. Today, it's only going to be about facts, documents, figures, patents, licenses, everything that brings us to the truth. We have no other weapon against this vast complex than exposing and bringing the dark works in the light of the truth. We have the hope that by our efforts, more and more people will become aware of the fact that we are deceived by our leaders. So today, we, as a family, join forces with the people who publicly made known to the world that chemtrails are not a conspiracy theory, but a conspiracy fact from the Technische Universiteit Delft in the Netherlands. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Koen Vermeer.
Well, I'm Koen uh, Vermeer, I'm a university professor of Delft University of, of Technology. Usually people are with their heads to the ground in their own two-dimensional space and they don't look up. But if you do, you see more and more spaces like this. And it, it, it worried me too. I, I have no explanations to our students about these phenomena. And then I studied it myself and I found out that I couldn't give them the answers they wanted because I think that the phenomenon is not natural. It's not natural what is happening and the explanations that are given to us uh, are not enough for me. If you look at them from a scientific point of view, the first thing a scientist does is trying to explain something. Because I'm smart and my students are not as smart yet, so I have to give them answers to questions. But if you ask most scientists honestly, they cannot answer all your questions. If people are using uh, climate control all over our heads, I want to know about it. I want to know the consequences, I want to know the health impact, I want to know everything. I need, as a teacher in my university, to give answers to my uh, students. And they have good questions. And I don't have the answers. And I want to know. Excellent. And we should discuss this. Ladies and gentlemen, from, for here you in the auditorium and for all over the world, Michael Murphy. Well, thank you very much. It's definitely an honor to be here in Belgium. The, the people who are in power control everything. They control the markets, they control us, and now they're even controlling the weather. And they can use that for warfare applications. The one thing that they cannot control is what God had originally made, and that's natural organic seeds. This is called the Hegelian dialect. It's called problem, reaction, solution. The problem here is massive amounts of aluminum things starting to die. The solution is company X that says, hey man, you're not getting yields on, on your crop. Everything's dying. But I got the solution. I got a seed that will grow in this environment. The only problem is now you have to start buying from me. We're a little concerned that maybe part of this agenda could be to kill off anything that's natural and organic and re-engineer it with aluminum resistant GMO seeds. Uh, many may know we just got back from a week of filming in Hawaii and uh, it was an incredible trip. A big concern for the people there is they're beginning to see softening of the coconut trees. But their concern is that these programs may again be part of a, uh, of a broader agenda to destroy anything that's natural and organic so that the corporate redesigned GMO foods might be the only thing, uh, only source of food for people. I didn't anticipate so many people, um, young and old, who are interested in, uh, in this phenomenon and are concerned about it. And I especially liked the, the address that the young girl gave uh, today. Uh, only 17 and already making an address to the, to the audience that is well, incredible. My name is Sophia Xenilis. I am 17 years old. It is quite scary to know that the air we breathe is not what it's supposed to be. That the food we eat and the water we drink contain traces of those substances which are sprayed out over all of us as though we were being poisoned like insects. The feeling that this is causing me are feelings of deep anger and rage. I don't want to be poisoned. I don't want to have to be infected with cancer. And I'm just so angry that this global poisoning can be going on on such a massive scale. And not enough is being done to stop this crime. A clear answer to one question. Are we being spread? Have we been spread? Yes. And is it their intention to spray again and again? What are we going to do about it? How are we going to deal with it? How are we going to stop it? I know the answer. There is only one person who can stop it. And you know it. You are. You are person, the one you have been waiting for. We are magnificent, beautiful, godlike, divine human beings. Ladies and gentlemen, sisters and brothers, 
in this auditorium and in the whole world. Thank you so very much for being present with us. And for now, please enjoy this anthem. So, uh, anyway, I'm glad that the weather's been good for you fellas so far. I just think if we were doing this in the wintertime, you might, if you're going to Washington, D.C., you might run into snow. <laughs> Thank God or not. That's right. Um, you know, it's interesting because of the, uh, the different weather modification programs, there's something like, I think, right around 32 in the continental U.S. alone going on. So the theory is that geoengineering is in part weather modification. You know, Mike, that's a very good point. There are so many subsets uh, connected with this issue of geoengineering. Uh, people are writing to us all the time with information about the connection to global warming, the connection to weather modification. Uh, some people uh, think there's a connection with Morgellons disease. Uh, others think it's, uh, it's kind of a, a means of transmitting electromagnetic uh, impulses from the harp uh, antenna system up in Alaska and Siberia. Boy, it gets your head spinning, and each area I think is is worthy of investigation. But we have so little time. I think it's wise for us to stay focused on just the air spraying and the toxic effect of these chemicals and the destruction of the planet and the damage to human health. What more do you need than that to convince people that we have to put a stop to it? So to stay focused, I think, is our mission on this one. Jeremy, we had an idea. We know that you know the political system real well. Our idea was this. We have a ton of data and information that we've collected throughout our travels. And, you know, we really think a good way to end the film would be addressing this to elected officials, some of the senators. So we were wondering this, if you might be able to come and kind of help us out and perhaps show us the way in, in how to get this done politically. But it sounds like a really good idea, and uh, all, all I'm also going to get to in terms of researching who it is that we should really focus on talking to about this. At the very least, if uh, we could make it, make, uh, make it impossible for them to claim that they don't know at this point, we can strip away their plausible deniability that they haven't heard of the data that points to uh, a geoengineering uh, stratospheric aerosol operation already going on. At the very least, it should be very interesting to go to district district of criminality and put uh, some people on alert. Yeah, you have a lot of enemies in Washington. That's that's where all the power comes together and the money, you know. So uh, there are people there, I'm sure, that just don't want us to do this job. But uh, I'm glad you're going, and uh, you'll find out. We took the data to Washington, D.C. There we presented our elected officials with the following letter. According to the fifth article of the Bill of Rights amending the Constitution for the United States of America, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. But the daily spraying is depriving all persons living within the United States of life, health, liberty, and integrity of our common and private property without due process of law. As a representative of the people of the United States of America, we insist that you do everything in your power to protect us and immediately put a stop to geoengineering spraying at once. There exists no justification, legal or otherwise, to poison the planet and its inhabitants. Now suppose that um, space aliens arrived on, maybe they're gonna land at the UN headquarters down the road here, or maybe they'll pick a smarter spot. But um, suppose they arrive and they give you a box, and the box has two knobs. One knob is the knob for controlling global temperature, maybe another knob is a knob for controlling CO2 concentrations. You might imagine that we would fight wars over that box, because we have no way to agree about where to set the knobs. No global governance, 
and different people will have different places they want it set. Solar engineering is like chemotherapy. No one wants it. But we all want the ability to do chemo and to understand its risks should we find ourselves with dangerous cancer. How long does it last up there? The lifetimes are years. What, years? A couple years. And then it what, precipitates out or? Yeah, that's correct. No toxic side effects? You know. The thing we always wonder about is the unknown unknown. Yeah. So if you're thinking about, say, the acidification, it's clear that's not a problem in several studies that showed that. Right. But of course the concern here is with so little research, there may be some unknown unknown that comes out of that field that bites us. My name's Mike Murphy. I'm a filmmaker in from Los Angeles. We're covering an issue called geoengineering. Okay, thanks okay. guys. Senator, quick you. question about the issue of the geoengineering. I'm afraid I don't know what you're talking about. And wondering if uh, you were supportive of geoengineers' proposals of spraying 10 to 20 million tons of aluminum into the atmosphere. I should really get a briefing paper on it before I get an opinion. Oh, not a problem. Are you aware of the issue? Not, at, not completely. No. At all? Because, okay. Um, do you have a letter from constituents and people have concerns? Yeah, what the... We're making a documentary about the... the I, I don't know. You guys have credentials to be here? Yes. Yes, yes we do. We, we pass through security as well. Endowed by our creator. I think so. Please don't touch that. Please don't. Please don't touch that. Please don't touch that. You're proper. So you're just... You're, just, you're, you're lying. No, what, 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 did we lie? what did we lie about, sir? No, we're not. What are we lying about? Lying about what? It's a little unusual, huh? I haven't heard that. No. Um, you're not aware of it? And it appears that these programs have already been deployed. You know, I haven't looked at that proposal, and so, you know, uh, well, why don't you let me review it? I, I can do that. Are you aware of... Actually, I'm going to go... Yeah. Let me go ahead and get that. I will take a look at this. And, and, uh, and I will uh, act uh, accordingly. General, this... Oh, I'm sorry. This program, this openly covert program of the aerosol spraying, stratospheric aerosol spraying, geoengineering, using uh, tons of aluminum, spraying it up in the sky. Okay. When when you were the head of NEMA, did you see the uh, the aerosol trails? Hi, sir. And we're covering an issue called geoengineering, and wanted to know if you're supportive of geoengineers' proposals. <laughs> hey, Congressman. I'm wondering if you're supportive of geoengineers proposals, which is dumping 10 to 20 million tons of aluminum into the atmosphere. Pardon? Uh, okay. Um, um, I, I'm not supportive. I, 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 I haven't looked at it. Uh, so I have, have you heard of the issue? Because it's becoming uh, uh, mainstream and public, and it's, there are actually congressional committees which are being formed to talk about these programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, I think when we drop anything into the atmosphere, we should know prior to the effect of that, right? Yes. And, and, and if we don't have the knowledge as, as to what the effect will be, we shouldn't do it. I think there are four different options for thinking about deployment of geoengineering. Uh, the first one would be we just ban it. I would argue that one does not want to get too firm a restriction in place on small-scale studies early on because it'll tie the science hands. I think what the science community ought to be trying to do is say, if you do small-scale stuff inside this space, and it's a scientific question what that space ought to be, there shouldn't be a lot of oversight and restriction. Congressman? Excuse me. Hi, I'm Mike Murphy from Los Angeles covering an issue called geoengineering. These guys are running from the uh, geoengineering issue. I wonder why. I'd have to talk to my staff. I don't know what the your, your details on that are. Have, have anyone made you aware of the issue? or? Sir? Did uh, your committee talk about geoengineering last November? Are you in support of those proposals? I'd love to give you a paper. Which? Uh, geoengineering? Or, 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 you know nothing about the geoengineering issue? 
Texas. I've never heard of it. They call it geoengineering, but... Uh, yeah, i never heard of it. Uh, it's nothing I've ever heard anything about. Sure, sure. When we looked up in the air today outside, we see we saw this stuff going on. Quickly, have you heard of geoengineering? No. The proposal is to shoot 10 million tons of metals into the air. This committee, Science and Technology, covered it for the first time. No. No, never heard of it. So, we were very concerned. Hi, how you doing? We spoke with uh, Congresswoman Watson's office, and her press secretary, Ms. White, is, was familiar with uh, Representative Kucinich's uh, Space Preservation Act, which mentioned chemtrails and the weaponization of the atmosphere in space, and then it was pressured uh, to be taken off of, off of the, off the uh, bill. Did you, did you see the aerosol spraying going on today over the Capitol? Geoengineering carries with it a tremendous range of uncertainties, ethical and political concerns, and the potential for catastrophic environmental side effects. He, he's, uh, he's not one to do interviews very often, uh, so uh, not unless we usually really pressure him into it. Okay. So, uh, so don't, you know, all that is, don't hold your breath. As chairman of the Committee of Jurisdiction, I feel a responsibility to begin a public dialogue and develop a record on geoengineering. We want to know if you're supportive of their measures by spraying 10 to 20 million tons of aluminum no. into the atmosphere? No, no I think we, have to have, we need to have more research. Okay. And about the issue of current deployment, there's literally a mountain of evidence that uh, many people believe proves the deployment of these programs. Any knowledge of that? No, I, there's certainly not a mountain of evidence. Uh, but I, I do support research into the uh, into geoengineering, and I also uh, support looking into the international governance of that. Okay. I hope you know anybody that has studied it knows which I think that it's a radical proposal, and I hope we don't have to use it. But there may come that point in time where we do. Now, if we could provide you with the evidence that suggests that these programs are and have been ongoing, would you be willing to address this publicly? We, we, we've had about three or four meeting, uh, hearings on it. We have addressed them publicly. Well, it, not not about the proposals, current but about deployment. the current deployment of these programs. Uh, Citizens, I, I, don't, I don't support the current deployment. I think we need to have more research, and they, they have consequences that go beyond one nation. And so I think that uh, it needs to be governance to that. Governance is not simply an issue of deployment, but governance before deployment, in terms particularly of large-scale scientific fieldwork. I can see that um, on this subject and in general, it's not popular to talk about global rules. And when these people started talking about uh, the need for UN Security Council oversight, a supranational environmental security enforcement with a strong mandate by the UN, you know, it, uh, it really is clear that they're looking for a global power behind the manipulation of the environment. But I do think it needs to be sort of an international uh, kind of cre uh, treaty that does tie and bind all nations into a common fate. It is a common fate. And unfortunately, it's not just big governments that could do this. It is small governments. It is <coughs> billionaires probably could figure out, I'm going to save the world all by myself, and I won't bother to mention it. How do we decide when there's a planetary emergency? Whose hand is on the thermostat? How do we decide when to start it? There's no way to do that right now. And what if we do start doing it? And then by some uh, problem with uh, the technology or with the will, uh, the, we can no longer do it. In a year or two, the aerosols will come out of the atmosphere and temperatures will shoot up at a rate much faster than it's going up now. And it's that rate of change that's hard for us to adapt to. So once we start it, we'll be sort of locked into doing it for a long, long time. And so that, and with, with basically no end in sight. Boeing would pursue this to make a profit, right? I mean, the financial motivation to do this. Um, let's see. So let me not speak for Boeing. <laughs> is that allowed? Okay. Yeah, well, it is what it is. Um, no, but if, but it's someday if, if the U.S. is going to decide to do this stuff, uh, they're going to turn look to a company who can do it, and you want to be positioned. Boeing would rather be uh, get it than Lockheed Martin. Um, so certainly, uh, we have an industrial base that helps the country uh, take on technologies and uh, large-scale challenges like national defense. And uh, we do that both for a profit motive as well as, uh, um, I think, uh, as a national uh, service. So. I think it would be truly disastrous if, 
you know, we discovered a few years from now that uh, there was a black program that some uh, government had stood up to sort of learn on the, on the quiet how to do this. It's pretty clear you can cool the planet, but you will not and cannot bring it back to exactly the same climate state you started with. So you may or may not, and I expect we'll have a lot of back and forth about how useful it is to ameliorate the risks of climate change. I think there's a good evidence it probably is useful, but we don't know. But it certainly can't get you back to exactly the climate you started with. I think everybody agrees with that. Do you think you'll see deployment in our lifetime? I, I'll let me say I hope not. Al? I would agree. I hope yeah. not. Yeah, well, I, I hope I not. Agree. Okay. <laughs> I, I see this as something like an evacuation plan, uh, you know, that you, that you, uh, you know, build big dikes, maybe that's the emissions reduction to try to keep the flood from wiping you out, but that if you should, that flood should come, that you'd like a plan uh, for, for what to do in the event of that catastrophe. So I see these options more as a catastrophic response option and not uh, as a way to reduce risk of everyday climate change. You would advocate mitigating consumption of beef as, as a means of accomplishing your objective? Uh, yes. How would you suggest going about that? You can't, uh, I, I don't, I don't add, uh, I mean, it's your job to decide what to tax and what not to tax. Obviously, if you wanted to people to behave differently, you give them incentives and disincentives for behavior. But I'm sure that's the answer you wanted to hear, uh, Mr. Smith. <laughs> if only my time uh, had not expired. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Chairman. Because there's literally aluminum and bearing contamination found around the world, believed to be from these programs. Like, look, today over the Capitol, it looks like they're deploying some type of aerosol. Did you see it? No, I didn't, but you see it. In a James Bond scenario, some rogue rich guy puts some airplanes in the air and seeds the clouds. What is to prevent that? Okay, are you aware of the issue? You do it through the other. Are you in support of those proposals? What is your take? I don't know anything about it. I've got a chair here. Okay, we'll give you a letter on that. Yeah, this is a letter from constituents. Okay, great. Excellent. And, and many people believe that these programs have already been deployed because mass contamination has been found. Uh, geoengineering programs, stratospheric. Yeah. Spraying, spraying from airplanes. So we're, what, what is happening, people from around the world are finding contamination. Let me take care of this and I'll talk to you when I come back. I'll be back in Thank you very much. We see that um, even though we might make the average temperature of the planet about right, the rainfall patterns change some from today. And some places become warmer, and some places become cooler. So uh, there are going to be winners and losers in this geoengineering activity if we were to do it. But nevertheless, as David has said, uh, there are reasons why we might consider doing it. Many people are deeply concerned about it because of the toxicity of aluminum, and it has been addressed to Congress and various committees. Would you take a look at a letter from some of your constituents addressing the concerns? Oh, excuse me. Okay. Um, can I give you a, a letter from constituents? Are you aware of their proposals of dumping? Gotcha. Thanks. Well, I'm not familiar with it, so uh, I don't know what they're doing. Okay. Um, well, geoengineers are proposing uh, just that dumping aluminum and barium into the atmosphere. Why would we do that? Aluminum is a precious metal we can use. Well, the stated goal is to actually cool the planet. However, uh, there's a. <laughs> Sounds strange. Right, right, yeah. exactly. So they're proposing dumping these metals into the air uh, to block the sun, essentially. Um, we're here to find out what uh, members of Congress well, are. I hope we would have a strong hearing on that before we I, decide to do that. I would hope so. And there's Thanks. plenty of evidence that not only suggests that these programs have been deployed because we're finding contamination of aluminum and barium on the rain, uh, snow, and soil. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, LA County has seen a 200% increase of Alzheimer's over the last decade. Mm -hmm. Tons of uh, ground and water samples showing high levels of aluminum all around our state. Why don't you give me all the information you have? I have some very good people I will assign it to. Okay. And um, if you get it to Mr. Lavelle, okay. we will He's get got my card right. and send me an email. And yeah. we'll Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll right. be in touch. Okay. We are okay. investigating this, and there's literally a mountain of evidence 
that suggest that these okay, programs are Okay, move that mountain over to us. You got Let's it. Take a look at it. And, and look up, Thank keep you. looking up into the sky Thank and you'll you. see some of it. Oh, too. okay. Yeah, you will. You <laughs> can right. see the aerosols being sprayed out of airplanes quite a bit. Okay. So thank you. Yeah, the future of humanity is definitely dependent on it. So we're counting on people like yourself to uh, take some uh, proactive steps. So thank you very much, guys. You're very welcome. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Right. A lot of Congress was uh, running down the hallways to avoid uh, answering any questions, looking for doors in the hallways. So. Apparently, the war is against all of us, and we're all in a hostage crisis. People who took an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution are not only know this is happening, are participating in this. And all of us have a duty to stand up and speak out about it. Why is the water being contaminated? Why is the soil being contaminated? Why are aluminum-related diseases going up and it's affecting all of us? And thus, we all have the duty to stand up and speak out and get educated and, and stop this for our own sake, for our children's sake. It is a crucial moment in history right now. The human beings, we need to decide whether to live on our knees while being sprayed and poisoned every day, while being under a continual threat, or whether we are going to stand up and, and live as, as free human beings and seek truth, justice, peace, and freedom for, for all, all of God's children. So as you can see, we're ending our film here in Washington, D.C. We've made many public officials aware of this. Most of them either denied any knowledge of this or they simply uh, were unwilling to address uh, the situation with us. So as you can see right behind the White House, we do have aerosols behind us. The spraying has continued. What is the solution? Is the solution here in Washington, D.C.? Clearly. This is one of the solutions, but the solution is not only here, the solution is within you. This issue affects all of us so deeply, so you need to look inside. Please get active, get involved, start spreading the word with growing awareness. About 90% of the population, we believe, is unaware of this issue, which means 90% of the people who normally might do something if they knew, are not doing anything because they are unaware. So please, look into your heart, use whatever skill you have to get the word out. The future of humanity is dependent upon it.